the information continuum consists of K through 12 universities, libraries, businesses with enormous amounts of encyclopedic information that is not proprietary. Um, private investigators, information brokers, media including journalists with in-depth understanding of many topical issues that are of importance to economic competitiveness, government including state, local, um, defense and intelligence. There are iron curtains between the sectors, there are bamboo curtains between the institutions, there are plastic curtains between the individuals. Um, the content that those talented people are putting into their localized databases is, as Al Gore once said, rotting, like grain in the silos. Uh, most employees, you know, Robert Reich, great book, uh, Work of Nations, talks about the high performance workplace. What he doesn't talk about is the fact that the knowledge workers of America, which includes all of you, are on a starvation diet. You have to hack your way to, to information. Um, and I think one of the top priorities in this country needs to be getting content into the information commons. My friend Lee Feldenstein at Interval uh, coined the term information commons. Well, that commons is in fact a cesspool, all right? And it's empty right now. Most of what we know in these various distributed databases is not easily accessible. We got into a real nice conversation about ergonomics and how the command line was really a way of making the human a slave to the computer because the memory wasn't big enough in the computer so they had to basically modularly plug in the human uh, to run the command lines. Well, now we're getting to the point where memory and all this stuff can handle this, but the people building computers still aren't in an ergonomic mode. Uh, I mean, for instance, there are no piano pedals. I mean, why aren't we using our feet? Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff you could do. Um, and unfortunately, most computers are still being built by the people who grew up during command line times. Um, and lastly, or not lastly, the second, uh, so connectivity content, then you have um, coordination of research and development. This would need some changes in the antitrust laws. Uh, I'll give you an example from the intelligence community. Uh, I was on the um, Advanced Information Processing and Analysis Steering Group uh, of the Intelligence Research Development Council. And I formed the opinion that we had 10 different what we call black compartments. These are like 10 different closed doors. And they were each spending around $10 million a year to build a desktop workstation for their domain. This equates to $100 million a year to build 10 different versions of the same generic information handling requirement. Okay? Now, if you extrapolate that to the rest of government, the rest of the private sector, I think you're looking at two to four billion a year in this country diddling with end user computers. Okay? Uh, so coordination of research and development within industries, uh, within uh, different government departments and so on, I think that needs to be orchestrated a little better. We need to work to move the common denominator of the tools up. Um, and lastly, security. I mean, you know far better than I. Uh, rah, rah. Uh, you know far better than I. Uh, that's uh, a person who should remain unidentified. Uh, um, security in this country is a joke. Uh, in fact, I just I love this book. I just read uh, a Unix Hater's Handbook, and it talked about how Unix security is an oxymoron. And I was told I might be stoned for that, uh, but it is. Uh, Corporations that want to be secure, government departments that want to be secure, individuals that want to be secure, cannot possibly achieve security when they're living in a cesspool. We have a national information environment that is nothing more than a cesspool. Uh, and it is impossible to stay clean when you're up to here in shit. Uh, and I would like to get the government's attention in this area. Uh, because I think that in the age of information, the ability to collect and produce and disseminate information is absolutely vital to national security and national competitiveness. Now let me stop and get my instructions. Okay. If anyone wants to go to the bathroom, we're starting in seven minutes. Okay. Um, so I, I think you, your nation needs a, a strategy. Uh, and let me say, if I have some remarks prepared that I'll hold until until the officials start. Yes. Do you mean by a strategy? Do you mean legislation? Do you mean someone just sort of pointing the way? 
strategy to me, who makes the strategy? Who enforces it? Yes, I will. That, that is a very good and important question, particularly in a democracy. Uh, the question was, what do I mean by strategy? Do I mean legislation? Do I mean centralization? Do I mean uh, regulation? So on. Strategy is about relating ends to means. Strategy is about deciding what your objectives are and then developing a process for achieving those objectives. Now, I don't mean to be insulting with Strategy 101. Uh, but the reality is, and Paul Straussman uh, is a friend of mine, the NII puts technology before policy. You know, Paul is the former director of defense information, the CIO, former CIO for Xerox. He's written information payoff, uh, business value of computers, and I'm reviewing the galleys for his next book, which is great, uh, the, uh, the Politics of Information Management. As Paul points out, technology simply makes bad management practices worse. You first have to rethink what you're about, what you're doing, and then you have to apply the technology. For me, a strategy means achieving a national consensus on where we want to go as a nation in the age of information. I think legislation is part of it. If you guys uh, like browsing in, in cyberspace, my server in California is OSS.net. Easy to remember, Office of Strategic Services.net. Uh, it's actually I'm OSS8. Uh, but um, open source solutions. Uh, <laughs> but very deliberate. You know, I mean, it was for me, it was a rude shock to figure out that $10 million for classified computer system didn't stack up very well against $20,000 a year for LexisNexis. I mean, that just blew my mind. Uh, I've been a collector on my... What's that? The Marine Corps is a very austere environment. Uh, and we spent $10 million over five years to build what we call a sensitive compartmented information capability. If you want to read about it, uh, Toffler's, uh, Heidi and Alvin Toffler's War and Anti-War, the chapter on the future of the spy, is uh, kind of tells that story. And the preceding chapter on the knowledge warriors is kind of about Paul Straussman. Um, this is a very exciting time. And so the legislation that we've drafted, the National Information Strategy Act of 1994, has not yet been read by members. It has been read by staff. It's in its second staff iteration. I'm gradually going to wear these guys down. Uh, and, and I would like to think that if not this year, then next year, we will get a strategy that addresses the four C's. Connectivity, content, coordination of research and development, and communications and computing security. We are about to have some electronic Chernobyls. You know this better than I. Uh, one of the points I was making out there was that hackers, by their brilliance and by their perseverance and stamina and so on, have an, an inherent ethic. But now a lot of the tools that hackers created are shareware in the hands of idiots and criminals. <laughs> okay? This is a problem. And since I know the gentleman from a question he had asked earlier, I know he's concerned about centralization. This is the age of distribution. Uh, however, um, you know, I'm not sure just-in-time order works in the electronic environment. Uh, and, and chaos theory and anarchy are all very nice, but when Vince Cerf says we're behind the eight ball on internet security, I mean, that's like me jumping up and down and screaming and pulling out my hair. Uh, Vint is worried. That's the president of the Internet Society, for those of you that aren't familiar with him. Uh, he and Robert Kahn built that thing. There's no security. Your house, in a distributed environment, your house is as open as the next. Um, I mean, epidemics spread fast. You know that. Um, so I think a strategy is absolutely essential in order to harness the intelligence of the nation and to establish the foundations for national security and national competitiveness uh, as we move into the next century. Uh, we are way behind the Swedes, the Japanese, the Taiwanese, the Israelis, the Indians, even the Indonesians and the Malaysians. Um, we, in terms of having a strategy and exploiting information, uh, steal what you can, buy what you can't, uh, you know, it really is, is, this is a remarkably stupid country uh, when you get right down to it. What do you mean by a strategy? Are you talking about a set of protocols or a set of... Uh, this isn't computer talk. Uh, this is political talk. How does, how does a free market country like ours take on a set of political strategies? Free market country. 
Well, healthcare is a good example of an attempt to develop a strategy. And let me tell you about the hidden bomb in healthcare. Universal healthcare frees all the slaves. Think about it. Universal health care lets all those people now trapped in corporate jobs primarily because of the benefits package, particularly those people with existing disabilities. It allows them to go out as freelancers and not worry about their health and the health of their families. Well, One of the, what? Well, you think so? Okay, please. Freedom of shoes, freedom to lose. All right, all right, let's take that. Good. I'm not sure I understand it, but it sounds wonderful. Please, let's clap. It, uh, <laughs> all right, one more question and then, or do you want to start? Let's start. Hi. You don't know me, <laughs> but I know you. We have your names. Um, welcome to Hope. This is it. Uh, this is the culmination of uh, 10 years. We started a magazine so that we could have a conference. That's what it's all been about from the beginning. Uh, this is Rob from Amsterdam. Uh, he puts out a similar magazine, Hactic. And, all of what you see inside is, uh, is the production of people like Rob uh, that, are, that are working all night long. Uh, a lot of coordination has gone into uh, putting this thing on. They said it could never happen in the United States. Well, it hasn't yet, but it will by the end of Sunday. Uh, with your help, we've never done anything like this before. We've never uh, had a conference this size, of this spirit, and we think we can do it. We think we can do it with your help. Uh, of course, we are a bit late. We're running an hour late, so just add an hour or so to everything that's on the schedule, which we just got. Uh, sorry for all the inconvenience with the registration. Um, <coughs> we ask if you have a red badge, and I see most of you do, at some point turn it into one of these nifty pictures uh, at your leisure, because uh, it's really nice to have. Uh, Rob has a few things to say as far as um, uh, general housekeeping rules, but for the most part, uh, enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll get back to you. Uh, for the most part, just enjoy yourselves, have fun. Um, uh, don't cause the hotel too much grief. Uh, so far, everyone's been really good, and uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, make history here, much as we did last year in Holland. Okay, here's Rob. Uh, first, a few things. Uh, that are household. Uh, indeed, these orange badges have to be changed to white ones. The process we have for making the white ones is a little slow. We had counted on that being faster, so excuse us. Um, there's a few household worries. People should not be wandering through the hotel carrying lots of equipment in the normal elevators. If you have really a lot of equipment, use the freight elevators. Everybody in the hotel knows where they are. So don't, don't hold up the normal elevators because they buzz like crazy if you keep them open. So if you're bringing any more equipment in, use the freight elevators. Um, the area behind the toilets, behind the man's toilet, there's, there's a hallway that leads down. Do not go in there. There's nothing interesting there. There's just... Uh, <laughs> it, it's only empty 9X offices. There's, uh, there's uh, rooms that contain... All the air conditioning equipment for this building, you can go out on the roof, there's hallways leading into stairways, that, that it's nothing interesting, really. Uh, no, but what I, what I mean is we can't have people hanging out there because we get kicked out of the hotel. So if you absolutely have to, do it Sunday afternoon, an hour before we have to leave here anyway. Um, that's as far as that. Uh, the network, uh, I don't know how many people here, let's, let's do a show of hands here, how many people have brought something that they expect to hook up to coax ethernet? Oh, okay, that's not too many, that's good. Uh, in about an hour or two, we'll be handing out the IP numbers and we'll be actually connecting people and helping you out. There'll be a staff of people with the tables. Uh, if you walk into the pentop room from the entrance, it'll be the left side of the room uh, that will have the, uh, the ethernet connected. Um, how many people have something that they expect to link up to a serial port somehow? 
Oh, many, yeah, that's okay. Uh, there's the terminal server with all the terminals hooked up. There'll be some empty leads there where you can hook up either through slip or using terminal wire. If you know what that means, that's okay. Uh, we'll be working on that a little later on. That may not work until 4 o'clock or, or, or 4.30 this afternoon. Um, as far as the rest of the network goes, internet connectivity may go up and down. It may be very slow. We have two 28.8 modems connecting us in and out of the internet, so it may be slow at times. If you're going to FTP GIF pictures, do it somewhere else. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, things should be fine. Um, well, I guess that was it for the network. If you're going to set up on those tables, don't use an entire table for one computer, but make it so that one, one computer is on each side of the table. Um, the schedule is going to be a little late, but Emmanuel already said that. Um, I guess that's it. Constitutional rights have been suspended. Stay in your homes. Do not attempt to contact loved ones, insurance agents, or attorneys. Shut up. Do not attempt to think or depression may occur. Stay in your homes. Curfew is at 7 p.m. sharp after work. Anyone caught outside the gates of their subdivision sectors after curfew will be shot. Remain calm. Do not panic. Your neighborhood watch officer will be by to collect urine samples in the morning. Anyone caught interfering with the collection of urine samples will be shot. Houses for trace elements at noon. Anyone who fails to display the required embossed black velvet Mexican painting of Alexander Haig on their living room wall will be shot. Cameras and surveillance equipment will be posted on all lampposts and streetlights. Anyone failing to attend required worship services on Sunday will be promptly arrested and dispatched to a re-education resort. Stay in your homes. Remain calm. The number one enemy of progress is questions. National security is more important than individual will. All sports broadcasts will proceed as normal. No more than two people may gather anywhere without permission. Use only the drugs prescribed by your boss or supervisor. Shut up. Be happy. Obey all orders without question. The comfort you've demanded is now mandatory. Be happy. At last, everything is done for you. Nobody move, you're all under arrest. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? <laughs>
six. I got him. It's kind of scary, isn't it? The good news is the power has shifted to individuals. Actually, I have notes on what Eric wants me to say. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about who am I, why am I here, and how can I help. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some remarks that I made uh, at CFP when, when I was honored by being included on the hackers panel. Can you all hear me in the back? Okay, thanks. Please shout out if I fade. Um, and then uh, we will go into some interactive questions and answers, and uh, we can recognize the suits by their neat shorts. So it'll be a ratio of one suit question to four hacker questions. Uh, and I'm authorized to enforce that. Um, all right, who am I and why am I here? You've got to admit this is a pretty neat trick to produce a suit uh, that talks your language or, or that is your friend. Um, I'm here because when I worked on an artificial intelligence project at the Central Intelligence Agency, I read a lot. And one of the things I read was Howard Rheingold's Tools for Thought. And the other thing I read was Shirley Turkle's My Second Self. And those books literally changed my life. Um, Shirley's book gave me an understanding of, of hacking. Uh, I am not a technical hacker. Uh, I'm an unemployment agency for hackers. Uh, and, and I do try and help link people together. But Shirley Turkle, with her book on MIT and the PDP and stuff, really made the point that hacking is an elegant piece of work. It's not a criminal act. And all these media people and all these government people that are going around saying hackers are criminals and, you know, we need to um, break them down. All these system operators. I mean, system operators used to be really smart people that had built the machines they were operating. Now a bunch of dumb administrators. Uh, and they get real upset when someone shows up in their system. And they think you should legislate that person away. Well, it doesn't work that way. So that book... Those two books kind of got me started on a path, and ultimately I was asked by the Marine Corps to resign from the Central Intelligence Agency and serve as the senior civilian standing up the Marine Corps Intelligence Center. And I did that. And we spent $10 million on a top secret classified system. And I talked a little bit about this earlier, so I won't, I won't belabor it. The bottom line is, after a lifetime of collecting secrets, I suddenly realized that most of my secrets were worthless uh, in terms of, of getting real work done. And when I did a cost analysis and looked at LexisNexis and BRS and EasyNet, and uh, back then in internet was in its infancy in terms of content. It was mostly chatter. Uh, but um, I found that for $20,000 a year, I could answer 80% of the intelligence requirements of my general officers. And the beauty of it was the product was unclassified, which meant it could be shared with just about anybody. Um, and I shared this with a member, uh, a staff, a Marine Reservist who was on the House Permanent Select Committee for Intelligence, and he wrote into the National Security Act of 1992, an Office for Open Source Exploitation. The Director of Central Intelligence was required to have an Open Source Intelligence Task Force, uh, and he just didn't get it. Now, bear in mind, intelligence has always used open sources, but in the, in the 60s and 70s, when we started getting into fancy satellites and, uh, and clandestine ops against the Soviets, we kind of lost sight of our origins. Uh, the OSS, Miles Copeland's book, Without Cloak and Dagger, talks about how when the OSS was first formed, they had all these lunatic requirements from the State Department, the Pentagon, and so on, and they put a guy in a room with the New York Times. And his job was to use the New York Times to answer these questions and just pretend it came from a very complex system of risky agents. <laughs> it worked! It became the most important unit in the new CIA. And we lost sight of that. We got too wrapped up in technical collection. We got too wrapped up in denied areas. We forgot the basics. So for me, working for the Marine Corps was a real privilege, and I learned a lot. But Gates just didn't get it. Uh, so I asked my general officer, actually I asked my SES equivalent, for permission to run an international symposium on my own time to more or less jumpstart the issue of open source intelligence. 
and I got permission. I met the requirements of SECNAV Instruction 5000, which is that you declare your interest, you take no money from the from the Marine Corps, and your, your supervisor agrees it's in the best interest of the government. This is where Howard comes in. I tracked him down. I, I had no idea what a wild man he was. I mean, Tools for Thought is a very sane, rational book. And, and nowhere in there do you see anything about painted boots and magician's uh, clothes and, and stuff like that. Um, but I tracked Howard down. I got him to agree to speak. I pulled together people like Bob Kahn, uh, Jay Keyworth, science advisor to the president, Paul Straussman. Admiral Studeman honored us with his presence and made some very sensible remarks. And don't misunderstand me. I am a strong supporter of the intelligence community. I think it needs to maintain its present level of funding. I just think that Jim Woolsey has failed miserably at reinventing intelligence. Uh, and getting it back to basics. Um, so please, I am not in any way criticizing the intelligence community as a whole. I just think they need to uh, uh, get a life um, <laughs> and, and come into the modern age. You know, it used to be the intelligence community with its satellites and stuff used to be like an oasis in the desert. But now they built a cement bunker around that oasis and they don't realize that someone's come along and watered the desert and all these private sector information capabilities have blossomed. And so their answer to taking advantage of that is to drill a little tiny hole in the cement bunker and stick a straw through it and suck on the internet. Okay? And it's going to take them five to ten years uh, to, to really come up to speed if they, if they continue with that approach. Anyway, to make a long story short, I uh, got Howard there, and Howard's condition for agreeing to speak, outside of a few little things like money, uh, was that I write an article for Whole Earth Review called uh, Ethics, Ecology, Evolution, and Intelligence, an alternate paradigm for national intelligence. The whole idea was to create a citizen's intelligence corps, to, to, make, uh, to put the power in the hands of the people, to allow people to be able to make informed judgments by having access. This includes government bureaucrats that are starved for information. The special assistant to the President of the United States and the National Economic Council told the Open Source Lunch Club that for economic strategy and economic decision making in the White House, the intelligence community is useless because it's not allowed to look at the automobile industry and so on. And the rest of the government is lousy at the business of intelligence. They don't know how to do collection management and distill products and put them together and, and get them up into, into decision memoranda. So what we have is a really dumb government going through the motions along the machine model lines. Anyway, that article subsequently led to, to my going to, uh, to Hackers 80 and Hackers 90, and, and I know that the management here doesn't recognize the, the Lake Tahoe hackers. Uh, they're the, they're the middle-aged guys that are now legal and making money. Um, but that really started me getting to know people. I went out to Europe. Uh, Rop was very good to me. Uh, I gave a, gave a talk there, got to know Emmanuel in the 2600 environment. Uh, and in fact, when I started my conference, I started bringing hackers in. And this is one of the points I want to make. The suits that attended my conference were absolutely flabbergasted at the hackers. I mean, one of them, uh, Tsutsu, the Japanese guy that does cellular hacking, uh, talked to an SCS, that's a general officer equivalent from DIA, and the guy came back to me later bug-eyed. He said, I didn't realize. I mean, he had this perception. Of, of hackers as sleazeball criminals. Um, and I think part of my role as your friend is to, is to use my suit power uh, to correct those misperceptions. Uh, Emmanuel was face to face with Greg Treverton, the vice chairman of the National Intelligence Council at my conference last year. It was awesome. Uh, I mean, talk about two opposite but complementary poles of brilliance. Now. Going on with this misperception thing, and I'll wrap up in about five minutes and we'll go into questions and answers. It bothers me that people don't understand that we have moved from the industrial era to the information era. And all these corporations, all these government bureaucracies, all these laws are from an old era. Thomas Jefferson was a hacker. He hacked the British Empire. The American Revolution broke British law and it established new law. Thomas Jefferson, in his memorial in Washington, one of the four quotes that's up there, is that while he does not believe in the need for frequent changes in the law, he does believe that the law must keep pace with the human mind. No more would he have a man wear the coat of his youth than to have old laws applied to new eras. Now, our government hasn't figured that out yet. Uh, and one of the things that I really am eager to see the President of the United States do 
is to commission a presidential commission on cyberspace law. I have asked Brian Kahin from Harvard to join us at our symposium, and I'm trying to find $25,000 in funding for him to establish a new legal framework uh, for cyberspace. I think one of the other points that, that uh, the management wanted me to make is that you're not alone. Uh, you have now achieved critical mass. I think it's absolutely phenomenal to see this room full of bright people. You are the pioneers. Like the pioneers of the Wild West, you are being crushed by the buffaloes. Bruce Sterling has written a book about it. Um, buffalo heard in, in the attack. Um, you are being shot at. You are falling into crevices and dying by the trail. Um, I just talked to uh, Fiber Optic on the phone the other day. Uh, if anyone from Echo is here, be warned I'm competing for his services. Uh, and I think that you represent a critical national resource. When the Israelis catch a hacker, they give him a job. I think this conference, I think of every single one of you as legal, law-abiding citizens that has enormous potential to make a contribution to our national security and our national competitiveness defined in a wholly new way, defined in a way that recognizes that electronic democracy is about popular intellectual power uh, and that attempting to encumber that power with mandated encryption systems and things like that is simply not going to fly. And now one final comment on why I am optimistic about your future. Charles Perrow has written a wonderful book called Normal Accidents, Dealing with High-Risk Technologies. He talks about how with simple systems, you have single points of failure. They're easy to diagnose. You can fix them rapidly. Complex systems, you have multiple points of failure. They're a little harder to diagnose, a little harder to uh, fix. With constellations of complex systems, you get very quickly to catastrophic failure. It's impossible to diagnose. I think that in this era of complex systems, the power has shifted to the individual because the power of an individual to completely immobilize, indeed destroy, a major corporation, a major government unit, a major telecommunications system is just phenomenal. Now, I'm concerned. I consider you the forces of good. I consider the people who have picked up some of your methods and are using them for criminal gain uh, or for malicious satisfaction, I think they're the enemy. Uh, and I would be very encouraged if the people associated with hope were available at appropriate salaries to help corporations and help others uh, figure out just how many holes are in their tent. Um, as again, as I said earlier, you cannot have a secure corporation if your nation does not have an overall environment that lends itself to security. With that, let me stop and say that I am really, I consider it an enormous privilege to be here. I was going to undress for you. Uh, I, beneath, beneath this, um, this suit is, is a Hackers 9.0 t-shirt from Lake Tahoe and a pair of shorts. Uh, but I do have detractors and enemies, and some of them are in this room, uh, and they would use it against me in Washington. So look for me later in appropriate clothing <laughs> with this hat. Now, please, let me, what, what kind of questions have you always wanted to ask a spy? Okay, that's a two-part question. What's with the NRO, and, and why did it take them so long to kind of get their act together, and why do intelligence agencies have to uh, keep their budget secret? Well, there are a number of senators that agree with you that the budget should not be secret. Uh, part of the reason for secrecy, let me come out in reverse, part of the reason for secrecy is that how you spend money tells a lot about your sources and methods. Uh, the intelligence community essentially consists of of the clandestine operations, which is humans handling agents 
where you go out and you recruit someone, you persuade them to betray their country or betray their corporation, usually for money. That's what I did. I was very good at it. Uh, and I've left that behind me because I realized a lot of it wasn't very useful. Now, I still I think we need to do that. But I think we need to do it in a much cleverer way. Um, right now, it's real easy to recognize who the spies are overseas. Um, and uh, my personal opinion is that at least 50% of our clandestine assets, if not more, are already known to local liaison and they're just stringing us along. Uh, I personally feel the clandestine service needs to be doubled in size, but it needs to go deep and long. It needs to have a lot more, a lot more capability. But if you revealed its budget, you would be revealing a lot about how it does business. So I support secrecy and intelligence. Uh, let, me, let me also say Keith Hall, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense uh, for Intelligence, just gave a great speech to the Open Source Lunch Club the other day. And he pointed out that intelligence is about secrets. It's about collecting information which is not available by other means. And he firmly placed open sources in the category of other means. Uh, there are some nasty, nasty people out there running out all the way from, from Libya and Iran. The four warrior classes of the future that I talk about are uh, high-tech brutes, low-tech brutes like narco-traffickers and criminals, including you now have a very vicious Vietnamese and, and Russian criminal gang that's international in scope. Um, low-tech seers, mobs, Islamic fundamentalism, um, used improperly. I have nothing against the religion. And then high-tech seers down to the 13-year-old uh, Pakistani uh, working through, uh, through uh, US computers that pay his phone bill both ways uh, and coming in and, and running amok. Um, there's an arms race going on in cyberspace, and we're not competing. Uh, so I think secrecy is appropriate for those specific details in the intelligence community. I, I completely support the community in that. But I think the totality of the budget needs to be known. The other thing that concerns me is that there is a number that is not secret but is not known. And that is how much the US government spends on unclassified information collection, processing, production, and dissemination. You are being ripped off as a taxpayer. I am being ripped off as a taxpayer. The US government is the most inefficient information processing kludge I have ever seen. And that scares the hell out of me because we're in the age of information. Our national competitiveness depends on that. Now, to the NRO. The NRO got its start. I love talking to former members of the NRO. I say, NRO, NRO, NRO. It just drives them crazy. Because, you know, I mean, they've gone through their whole life. It's, it's those, you know, we, we, I mean, people, when you go into surgery, they send someone in to make sure you don't say NRO while you're under, under gas. Um, same thing with CIA and NSA. National Reconnaissance Office. Those are the people that build the satellites that collect images and signals. One of the most positive, constructive things the President of the United States has done in recent uh, months is direct Jim Woolsey to put one meter resolution imagery into the private sector. Lockheed and ITAC are competing. Now Spot is doing real time imagery. Okay, they've got a little neat little thing here now where they can have their satellite over there and they can bring in this thing on a C-130 and you can see it in real time. That's cool. Um, and what the president recognized, which Jim Woolsey and his deputy directors did not recognize, is that times have changed. We can no longer keep the satellite assembly lines open with that kind of restricted customer base. And the power of American brains and American know-how is going to atrophy unless we start doing these things in the commercial market. And I, I think that it is a shame that Jim Woolsey was let down by his staff uh, and that he had to be embarrassed uh, by the president with, with some pushing from George Brown on the Space Committee. Uh, by the way, a, a bona fide hacker, Peter Kennedy, uh, is on that Space Committee as an assigned fellow. Robert Kennedy, thanks. Robert Kennedy is on that committee. And Robert, here's a, this is a good hacker story, hacker in Washington. Um, Woolsey's in there testifying to George Brown, and he's staring straight ahead. He's very angry. And Brown turns around, and Robert's sitting behind him. He says, uh, I'd really love to have that that uh, poster that shows all the satellites in space. So Robert ambles out of the room. He calls around town. He finds out that the editor of Aviation Week has one over his wall. He jumps in a taxi, races over there, brings it back, puts it on an easel, and George Brown says to Mr. Woolsey, I direct your attention to the number of satellites in space. Are you telling me we can't allow Lockheed to put another one up? And uh, so Robert, that's 
making your bones. Uh, he really impressed the hell out of those staffers, and uh, that's one small contribution to the progress of this dialogue. Now, the NRO started because we didn't know anything about the Soviet Union. It was a so-called closed society. And it seems to be an American penchant to try and answer hard problems with technology rather than people. And so instead of developing really good legal traveler programs, instead of really putting some effort into debriefing Soviets coming out of the Soviet Union and so on, we built a really gee whiz U-2 followed by satellite. And it took great pictures. The Soviet Union was so important, it took those great pictures day after day after day after day. It didn't take pictures of anywhere else in the world for all practical purposes. And I say this, this is informed judgment. I was on the Foreign Intelligence Party's Committee and all those other things. It's, it's nice being the second civilian in Marine Corps intelligence. Um, basically, the system got perverted. And it became a gee whiz kind of program. It was hiding behind so many closed doors that it couldn't be, it wasn't accountable. Now let's get to the NRO office building. I mean, in an era of declining intelligence budgets, in an era when we've just put one meter resolution imagery into the private sector, do we really need a 10 building complex? No, this is the last hurrah. Uh, it's my personal feeling that the NRO did indeed obfuscate its budgetary things. Uh, it hid the building in base. Base is stuff that's been previously approved. New initiatives are things that are coming up for the first time, and ongoing initiatives are things that have been approved but are in their five year rollover period. Um, I think Dick Consini is setting the stage for the departure of Jim Woolsey. Uh, I'd be very pleased if the NRO's office buildings became the new open source intelligence center for the nation. Uh, <laughs> another question. Yes, sir. Well, okay, that's, that's a three-part thing. One is the assumption I'm primarily military intelligence. That's not correct. I spent nine years at CIA. Uh, I, I was very proud and pleased to be at CIA. Um, I still respect that organization and the people who work there. I then went to become a civilian in Marine Corps intelligence because they wanted me to stand up the Intel Center. I had had, I'm mean, one of the few people that served in three of the four directorates at CIA. I've done overseas ops, I've done satellites, I've done tech, uh, and I can read and write. And, you know, it, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was good, it was a good package. I was very proud to go to the Marine Corps. Um, God bless them because they changed me. Second item, you, you assume that the military is very good at buying weapons that kill people and not very good at computers and processing information. Actually, they're not good at either. Um, <laughs> I helped kill the M1 tank in the Marine Corps. Uh, the first time the M1 tank was bought by the Marine Corps, it was bought under pressure from the Army, which needed a larger buy. Uh, the Army was pushing the uh, 120 gun so it could take care of the central front. And the Marine Corps didn't have an intelligence center. Now, the M1 tank weighs 70 tons, and it invented the concept of gallons per mile, okay? Uh, it also fries infantrymen in its vicinity. Um, the second time, the commandant had the good sense. He had an intelligence center. He asked me, he, his colonel asked me, and so I had a little study. We went back and we said, well, weighs 70 tons. European companies will not sell a commercial truck that weighs more than 30 tons to the third world. Why? Bridge loading. Bridges will not carry more than 30 tons on the average. Second, main gun in the third world is a 105. Third, average weight of the battle tank out there is 35, 40 tons. Fourth, you have no cross-country mobility. In other words, the third world tends to be very hazardous terrain outside of about six countries. You can't get from the beach to the capital city off-road. Um, fourth, line of sight distance, intervisibility is under 900 meters. Jeez, maybe we don't need the M1. Maybe we need a helicopter with a big bad stinger on it. Um, but this is an example of unclassified intelligence making a strategic difference in a major procurement effort. Right now, and I've written extensively on this, uh, my, my article that addresses this point on yours is uh, a critical evaluation of U.S. national intelligence, uh, uh, which was in the intelligence, uh, International Journal of Intelligence Counterintelligence. I'm under a lifetime secrecy agreement. All of my written materials are previewed for security. Um, 
And uh, we don't do a very good job of making informed judgments about acquisitions programs. Once a program is underway, we don't do a very good job of uh, understanding the threat as it's changed. You know, when you have a 10 to 15 year procurement process and you have a private sector uh, that is able to develop things in a year or two, and then you have people who can go steal off the shelf capabilities, all of a sudden you have this, this, this mismatch. Now on computers, it's not the military, it's not the government, it's the country. Um, take the chief information officer concept. In my experience, it's mostly the senior tech weenie. Um, that's the last person that should be the chief information officer for a country, I mean for a, uh, for a company. The chief information officer for a company should be responsible for ensuring that every employee is a collector, delivery people, service people, whatever. They should be responsible for ensuring that the information that's collected is put into a corporate-wide database. My friend Paul Straussman invented the concept of corporate information management, which means one-time data entry, corporate-wide access. And they should be responsible for ensuring that the information supports the strategic intent. Um, and so I don't say the military has any answers. I'm saying that we as a country uh, need, to, need to come up with some solutions. And you as a group, I think, have a lot to offer. For instance, I'm still waiting to see that killer paper on how I would take down the United States in 24 hours. I mean, Peter Black gave it a stab in Wired Magazine. He had a very nice little article that, that listed, you know, Barking Sands Time Antenna and uh, Culpepper Switch in Virginia and a few other things. That was a fun article. Uh, Wynn Schwartow, his book Terminal Compromise, his lawyers wouldn't let him do this one. This is a great book. You know, do me a favor, improve on this book. This is Information Warfare, Chaos on the Electronic Superhighway. Uh, it's got a blurb by one Robert Steele on the back. I obviously believe in this book. This book is my weapon for scaring the hell out of everybody in charge of communications and computing in this country. Uh, Wynn Schwartow, he's here in the, in the white shorts and the, uh, the Oklahoma version of a Hawaiian shirt. Uh, <laughs> Wynn, are you here? I guess not, he's doing more important things. He's heard me before. Uh, but Wynn Schwartow, I encourage you to talk to him and frankly, I want you to write the next book. I'd love to see you guys hope as an organization, publish a book on your views on what's wrong with our existing system and how it can be fixed. Um, I don't ask you to publish how to do it. <laughs> because I trust you, I don't trust the people that will read your book. Uh, but I think you have a lot to contribute. Another question. Yes, sir. Yeah, what do you think about the current state of computer education in America? Mm. Education in America is non-existent. Is that with 1993? School I've gone to in 1989, elementary school, they had a tandy color computer to and intermediate school, there are Macintosh twos, ancient, yeah. and a Commodore 64. We're supposed to be the most industrialized nation in the world. We're supposed to be on the edge of the future. Yeah, and but we're not. Are obviously the future. So how come? Let, me, let me cut to the chase. The, the, the question is, why do we have such lousy computer education in this country? Um, and of course, I feel we have a terrible education system. I, I make the comment that, that we now sentence every, everybody in the United States to 12 years in prison, followed by two to four years in a halfway house called graduate school. Uh, you know, I, my stomach turns over when I see a yellow school bus. And I'm going to be watching very carefully when my five-year-old uh, starts school in September. Um, part of the problem is the education mafia. The, the teachers, the, the educational associations, they're in the Stone Age. They do not understand this stuff. Um, frankly, I would like to think, again, it's, it's very difficult to lead a revolution. It's very difficult to make a revolution. But we're now at a point where you guys represent the new educational system. You're self-taught. You're smart, you're applied, you have unlimited stamina, given an adequate supply of, uh, of snow cones and, uh, and other things. Uh, yeah, and, and I think you represent a new way of learning. Um, we're in a major transition period. Um, and I think that the kind of self-help that you can provide one another, the kind of coming together of boffs, of birds of a feather, um, that's going to be an important part of transition. 
Uh, I'm starting to see hackers that were in jail two years ago in very productive junior engineering positions. Um, and I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the purposes of a forum like this, and one of the things that I try and do in my own activities, including my newsletter, is to help people understand that it's what you can do, not whether you have that diploma. Now, having said that, I would also put an expiration date on all diplomas. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, you guys want me to stop or more questions? More? All right. Uh, you, sir, and then in the back. Please stand up. What? Yes, sensitive compartmented information facilities. Um, probably not. I suspect the information is, is available. Part of the pro oh, I'm sorry, the, is the public aware of how much money has been spent on Tempest, which is emissions protection, so that you can't use the Van Eck emissions effect and, and use one of those $100,000 Radio Shack vans to, to capture stuff, um, or whatever you've cooked up. Um, Tempest is a very viable and important program for protecting secrets. It is unfortunately not at all common in the corporate sector. Hughes STX had an excellent computer and communication security program and it went belly up because the market wasn't ready. Well, it's ready now. Um, and I think that BDM and a couple of other firms that I'm working with are going to start moving towards serious money making. The, the big thing we were talking about this earlier is, is your corporate information systems have 20% proprietary that deserves Tempest protection and 80% that doesn't. But because the proprietary is on the big system, they can't afford to tempest the whole system. And because the proprietary is on the big system, they won't allow the employees to reach out and, and barter and share that encyclopedia. So they're losing twice. One of the most fundamental things people have to do is decide what you really want to protect and give it tempest, full encryption, authentication, reliability, and so on. The other stuff, you need to have an open network and at the same time, you need to work aggressively through your government representatives, your, your lobbyists and so on. Um, I think I'm being thrown off. Um, to, to improve security. Mm. Recognize his face? Yeah, sure. Where is it? You don't know who this is? <laughs> what do you want me to do? Who it is. We are Kevin Mitnick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Bruce Sterling did not do me a favor, although, although I'm sure he had good intentions. Uh, wherever you are, Kevin, I have nothing against you. Please do not fuck with my credit account. <laughs> 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 oh, God bless. <laughs> yeah, I, for those of you that missed it, I mean, Bruce at the end of CFP said that, um, first off, the FBI rousted me out of my room um, because I was registered as Robert Steele, which is my real name. Uh, and uh, apparently Kevin uses the, um, the pseudonym Agent Steele, S-T-E-A-L. And they not, I had just come in from Australia through Hawaii. Uh, I was real tired. And I had gotten in at 5 in the morning. They knocked on my door at 9. And they were very, very handsome people uh, and very well dressed and very well behaved. And I have, please understand, I have absolutely nothing against the FBI for this action. They knocked on the door, I said, room service. And I woke up, I said, I didn't order room service, go away. So they knocked on the door, I gave this. This time they said, FBI. I said, okay. So, <laughs> so this large, balding, middle aged, fat man, okay, chunky. Toffler, Toffler calls me chunky, which is nice. We talked about whether it should be chunky or chubby and uh, settled on the more diplomatic term. Anyway, I go over to the door naked, open the door. Uh, however, I'm sticking out, okay? They did not ask to feel my legs. Um, but I think they recognized when I identified myself that I was the wrong person and, and they said they apologized and they went away. And I got absolutely nothing, nothing against it. Anyway, Bruce heard of that, heard of Kevin. They arrested someone else. And at the end of CFP, he said that I was 100 times smarter and 10,000 times more dangerous than Kevin. And a lot of us were spending time trying to figure out what he meant. Um, I think he means I'm trying to change the system as a whole rather than just doing individual stuff. But I, I realized recently that I hope it hasn't pissed Kevin off. And if any of you are friends of Kevin, uh, please tell him I'd love to buy him lunch. Uh, you know, anytime. Uh, 
<laughs> really, I mean, I am, I am no enemy of any of you. Um, all right, uh, where are we in, in terms of time? I mean, I'm at your mercy. I can either talk or I can stop. I can do an offline discussion with some of you. Stop. I'm gone. Goodbye. Oh. Rob, are you here? Is Rob here? Rob? Damn, okay. You don't have to clap again. Let me just show you this. Um, the hotel managed to lose these last year. We brought, we brought Emmanuel and Rop down to my symposium, and, um, and they had a session called Live Hackers, standing room only. And this is our Golden Candle Award to Rop uh, for daring to lead two public gatherings of the best of the European hackers. I think uh, a lot of him. <laughs>